Welcome to Compound Ideas. Hosted by Ken Majmudar of Ridgewood Investments, this podcast will feature exceptional individuals to uncover deep insights into business, entrepreneurship, personal growth, investing, and multidisciplinary thinking so that you can learn how to improve your finances, find better investments, and pursue authentic lifelong growth, wisdom, and happiness. Learn more and stay up to date at compoundideashow.com. Our guest on the show today is Nick Anderson, an advisor, mentor, and author. In this episode, we'll touch on how Nick overcame great personal losses and discuss his current focus on coaching and mentoring his clients. In our wide-ranging conversation, we'll touch on Nick's childhood and the trauma he experienced at that time and how he overcame his challenges as a high school dropout to flourish in the banking industry. We also discuss Nick's new book and the challenges that middle managers face and how to become a leader people will choose to follow. Please enjoy my conversation with Nick. My guest today is Nick Anderson. I'm really excited to have Nick on the podcast. As frequent listeners know, we cover a lot of new material in these podcasts, even with folks like Nick, who probably are on the circuit with his new book coming out. I'm excited to talk to Nick today about his book about his work, and really a lot about his passions and his arc life journey so far. So Nick, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks so much, Ken. Thanks for having me on. Excited for this. You know, what we usually start on Compound Ideas is origin stories. Tell us your origin stories. Start from the beginning. Where did you grow up? What was it like growing up for you? What were your formative experiences during that early stage of life? One word, I'm going to say traumatic. And a couple of words, rocky, surrounded in love and blessed. So all these things are true. I grew up just north of the Seattle city limit. So I call myself a Seattleite. Born and raised, been here all my life. The home that I was born into, my mother was an entrepreneur. She owned and operated a hair salon. And my father was both mentally ill and chemically dependent. So she asked him to leave when I was four. I don't remember much of the, the trauma up until then. You know, if I close my eyes hard, I can recall uh, arguments and fights. But when he left, I didn't understand. I didn't understand why dad was asleep. Four years old, who does? For the next six years, he was a weekend dad. And mom was the den mother of my Cub Scout group. And she took me to soccer games and, and all this stuff. When I was 10, my father succumbed to his illness and addictions and ended his life. And so you talk about formative years. There's a lot that could be unpacked there. Now, I went through my school years as a successful student, good grades, academics were, came easy to me, uh, but socially I was detached, let's say. I got my first real job when I was 17, and when I say real job, this was something that could lead itself into a career, and that was as a bank teller. And what happened for me was like this alter ego was born. I put on a button-up shirt and a tie, and I walked into the bank branch and stood behind the teller window, and people made all kinds of assumptions about me, and I let them, and I stepped into what they thought they were seeing and also kind of discovered myself in that, and in the very early stages of my career, I was invited into some, some leadership groups by executive management, kind of identified as an up-and-comer, and I just, I ran with it. I ran with it. There's a whole lot of life experience in between, but another couple of high points are that um, I, I met the, my future wife and mother of my children in a bank branch. True story, I was her boss, but she asked me out after I had transferred out of the office, so that was, <laughs> that was all good. We built a life together. We started a family, and we were living the dream, but six and a half years ago, she and I were out for a walk, and she was hit by a car and she didn't survive that accident. That changed everything. That's an understatement, but it changed everything. Let me pick up on a few threads here. And I'm really, that's a, that's a tragic story, which I'm, I mean, it's gotta be, I can't even imagine. Well, don't cause it's no good to imagine really. Yeah. There's a few things in life when you hear people go through that, you just don't even know how, if it would happen to you, you know, you would process things. And I mean, the closest I've come is probably 
I mean, 9-11, I was, you know, working around there the whole, my whole life, but thank God, like, fortunately, I didn't personally know anyone, but it was just really traumatic because of just constantly being there. And it was so much part of my life. And then recently, someone I was mentoring, unfortunately, might passed away at a very young age. That was probably the closest, what you're describing is something even hard to really imagine or process. And I'm just listening to it for the first time. But let's go back because I, I think there's more there. You mentioned your family situation growing up, obviously, with, with what happened with your mom and your dad. At age 10, were you aware Obviously, you said at four, you weren't aware, but at age 10, were you aware, oh, you know, my dad is gone? Is that like a thought that occurs to a 10-year-old? Good question. Yes. And I wouldn't believe it. There was a part of me that thought it was all a lie, that I was being duped or tricked or that I was in a dream. And so for years, and when I say years, let's call it a decade. I had fantasies that I would walk into the grocery store and see my dad just two heads in front of me at the checkout counter. I mean, just even saying that out loud it makes my heart tender right now because I held on to that. You know, I'd have the thought and then I'd shake it off. Like, oh, no, but maybe. That's the hard thing about this, like just processing it. Like I mentioned, you know, the person I was mentoring who was a daughter of a friend might have taken her own life. That seems circumstantially to be the case. You know, I wonder about things like COVID, what role that played and so many other things, you know, on mental health of people. That finality of it, it's just hard to wrap your mind around it, that I'll never see this person again. And by the way, I'm fortunate because I, I knew her for a year, so we were close. But I mean, I can't imagine like what her parents or her, she was such a delight that to have that gone, I don't know how you deal with it if you were constantly around it. When it's a child, spouse, a loved one, it's like a piece of you is gone. Yeah. And the funny thing is that I just saw so crazy, like just today, somebody on LinkedIn, it was LinkedIn or Instagram posted a thing. It was a side-by-side iPhone call from mom and dad. And they said, if you still expect to see this, then consider yourself lucky. Because there's a lot of people that would do anything to get this back. It's the truth. It is the truth. Your original question was focused on the formative years. And there's so much packed into this experience. But one of the things to unpack, really, as it relates to bringing the path to the present, is when you are, for me, as the child of a parent who chose to end his life, there is a big question that I'll never answer which is, why wasn't I enough for him to choose to stay alive? It's an impossible question to answer. It's a terrible question to ask because it's only torture. Because the real answer is it had nothing to do with me. And yet, that question was the fuel, was the fire, was the motivation for me to always be the best, to be very competitive, to... And even in a dangerous, unhealthy way, engage in relationship to the degree of codependency and enmeshment. Because if I lost the attention of someone whom I cared for, loved, I would fear that I lost them in my life, right? There's shadow stuff to that for sure, but there's also light. There's also goodness. And what that translated into is a skill set early in my career of building rapport and building relationships and connection and you know, an ability to be vulnerable and authentic and listen and care for. And so, you know, on some level, all of that made me a very successful salesperson and a very successful manager slash leader at a young age. So I was 19 years old, promoted into bank management, the youngest at the time for sure, and maybe the youngest in the history of the company for the, the roles that I was taking on. And I want to touch on something related to that as well. But before we do that, because we're talking about this topic, and I always like to start here because I think where we came from makes us who we are. I've learned this actually very recently, that vulnerability is like a superpower. And the more vulnerable we become, the more other people will relate to us because everybody at some level feels this way. But have you heard of Mark Manson? I mean, he's a pretty famous author. And so he wrote this book, uh, the subtle art of not giving a fuck, right? His second book, I think it's really good, is Everything is Fucked. 
the subtitle of it is a book about hope. And what's interesting is he touches a lot on these issues of mortality and childhood trauma and just a bunch of things that I had not really thought about. And for our listeners who are listening to this, if anybody's listening or whatever, or if you haven't, you know, yourself, I mean, I highly recommend, especially that second book. It's just really got some real incredible content in there to Mark's credit. Um, now, another thing you touched on, which I want to touch on, is you mentioned, okay, you know, you got into the bank teller thing and you specifically, I thought it was very interesting the way you worded it. You said something like people saw what they wanted to see. I wanted you to unpack that because I don't know what exactly you meant, but I thought that was just really interesting. You're in a bank teller, which is a kind of a transactional type of role. People are coming to the bank. They want their, make their deposit or whatever. So what did you mean by that? I'm going to use language. I don't know where we fall on this, but I'm just going to go right into the mock. People walk into a bank branch and they see this kid behind the teller window wearing a shirt and a tie, and there's all kinds of judgments that they pass. And for some in the modern dialogue, that's called privilege. And I just accepted it. You're saying like, oh, you're subservient to me, that kind of dynamic? No, no. A question I was asked frequently was, where did you go to school? which implied college, which implied that I did, which implied that I had graduated. So they thought I was older. They thought I was college educated. They didn't know that I was a high school dropout. It was it a power play of some kind, or it was just like, they just assumed that everybody did? No, not an assumption that everybody did, but an assumption that I did, because I'm speaking confidently, articulately, I'm knowledgeable, I, you know, I show up. Are you talking about coworkers, or are you talking about customers? Customers. Mm-hmm. Okay, interesting. My coworkers knew who I was, for sure. I was promoted into a management position when I was 19. And you would have started at what age? You would have started at 17. 17. So you, you start at 17, you're just a hardworking bank teller. You get tapped to be management. There was one role in between. I was a banker, a salesperson. I, so at 18, I was setting up bank accounts, retirement accounts, mortgage loans, home equity loans. And this was a bank in Seattle, like a local, like a Washington State bank? Mm -hmm. Just north of Seattle. Yep. Got it. Okay. What year would this have been or what, around what time frame? Started in 97. So we're talking late 90s. What happened after that career-wise? I didn't stay in a position or a role for longer than a year before I was tapped or asked to promote it into the next one. And so it was just this progression of... So real quick, just walk us through like, you know, not every single job, but like all the big ones. Teller, personal banker, assistant manager. The manager I was working with was asked to take on an underperforming branch. And she said, the only way I'll do that is if I can take Nick with me. So we went and took the stack rank, the lowest on the list and took it to number one. How did you guys do that? What was wrong with the branch before you got there? And what did you guys do? How long did it take to make it the number one branch? And we're talking number one out of how many branches at this particular bank? 40. 40. So one out of 40, which is a top two and a half percent, right? So how did you guys do that? Clarity of vision and accountability around execution, communication, and connection with the team. So Amy and I, Amy was uh, the branch manager. We already built rapport. She was the one that promoted me. And so we had trust. She and I had trust. That's right. Yep. We'd been through some stuff. And so we came in as a team and we were really clear with the existing team that was there that was struggling that, listen, we're, we came from the number one office to the number 40 office and said, not with hubris or arrogance that we're here to be number one, but with true humility, we're here to be number one. Because when you're number one, it's really fun. So here's how we do that. So the vision was, we're going to be the top performing branch. And then clarity around execution, which is, you know, there were a dozen or so metrics that were put into the formula to determine who was number one and two and so forth. And they were primarily sales goals, revenue producing goals. So this is how we're going to source opportunities. This is how we're going to vet opportunities. This is how we're going to close opportunities. We've got a system. We've got a playbook. And we're going to execute on that playbook. And to bring the folks in the office along, you know, there's a lot of communication. There's a lot of connection. I mean, you mentioned vulnerability. 
In my book, I've got two lessons. So the book I wrote has a hundred lessons and two of them back to back are focused on vulnerability. Number one is that vulnerability is necessary for human connection. But right behind that, I say that vulnerability is dangerous without security. So we came into that office very secure, knowing how to win. And so it was easy for me and safe for me to be vulnerable with the team and say, hey, like, these are the challenges that we face. This is where it's been really hard. This is where I've struggled. This is where I need your help. But I can do that from a place of security. Now, for those that don't know, right, So, because I'm an investor, investment manager, so I invest in all kinds of different industries. Different businesses have different metrics and things. In a bank, I believe, you guys look at, at least at the branch level, is what's your total assets in that branch? How many sort of checking account type deposits you have? How many CDs do you have? Let's flip that though, because the bank's balance sheet is backwards. So the asset to the bank is the loan. The asset is the money that the customers owe to the bank. And the liability is the deposits, right? It's the money that's owed back to depositors. So banks are nothing more than middlemen, right? And the movie, It's a Wonderful Life is the best example. You know, this isn't my money that I'm lending. It's Susie's and Bob's and Joe's and Ken's and, you know. And to put a little more meat on the bone of what you're describing, which is exactly right. They're in a spread business. They give the depositors less than they charge the borrowers. That's one aspect of it. But on the customer side, right, you have a choice of so many banks other than the branches near you. You happen to have an account there from a long time ago or whatever, like. What are the reasons that I would choose to bank with this particular bank and this particular branch or among, I can be with a a money center bank. I could be with Chase, you know, which is national, or I could be with whatever your bank was, you know, XYZ community bank with 40 branches. At that time though, the bank I was working for was a money center bank. It was Bank of America. Oh, it was. Okay. You are in a region of there, of Bank of America. Correct. Okay. Got it. So the goal is to acquire as many low-cost deposits as possible and deploy those deposits with as many, not necessarily high interest loans. The the game is not to get a wider spread because with that spread, you take on unnecessary and undue risk, right? It's it's risk-based pricing. It's to get the appropriate spread with the right type of loan product. And what year would this have been where you guys were put into the worst performing branch of B of A of, of that 40, that group of 40? Yeah, 1999. Oh, so very early in your, you know, just a few years into it. Yeah, so from 97, 8, 8 to 9, yep. Before you got there, did you guys have to diagnose it? Like to say, hey, what, what's wrong with this branch? Like, what are they doing wrong? Or it was obvious because you guys already knew of it or whatever? On some level, it was obvious. Um, there's some block and tackle stuff that you just do. So we endeavor to answer the question that you just posed, which is, why should I bank with you? So somebody comes in to cash their payroll check and we would like them to, instead of cash it, deposit it into a bank account. Somebody that has a bank account with us may need to finance their children's college education. So we'd like them to use us perhaps for the home equity line of credit if they don't qualify for student loans, et cetera. These are the common things, but why us? Coaching the front line, coaching the tellers on how to, number one, identify these opportunities and number two, engage in that conversation and take that person at the teller window over to my desk where we can have a deeper conversation, explore challenges, solutions, et cetera. All of that was a part of the game plan, but the block and tackle stuff is right up front. How do you identify these opportunities? And then what questions do you ask to see if, if there's a there there? Uh, and if there is, send them over to the desk. That's great. Now, fast forward. So what's your next big career Uh, And we got to get through it kind of relatively in the next five minutes so we can talk about the book and stuff. So I was tapped to ask to join the bank's training and development group and teach classes was a deviation from kind of the management ladder, but it was an exceptional experience that informed so many things. Then I was brought back into the retail bank as a branch manager, some great opportunities I then felt disenchanted with Bank of America. There's a story there. So I left and went to a very small community bank to lead. So what year would this have been now? That was, I think so, 2005. Okay. So now you're seven, eight years into your career. And so uh, I joined a very small community bank as the head of retail banking. So the head of the consumer branch side 
How many branches did they have? There were two. So I was going to say that title sounds bigger than, than the job was to begin with. Almost like a de novo. It was, yeah. De novo, had, for those uh, who are listening who don't know, it's, it's a new startup bank. Yep. Started in the year 2000 and had grown to two branches and there were growth plans. So I was brought in 2005 to lead the growth plans for branching and marketing. So we opened two more offices, effectively doubled the size of the balance sheet from 60 million to 100. It was 110 million in deposits to my recollection. And then, you know, the financial crisis took hold a few years later and that bank failed in 2010. Transitioned to commercial banking, went to another regional financial institution and headed up the commercial payments division, corporate treasury. And so this took me to a different side of the bank where I'm working with large corporates in their, if we think about the life of a dollar through a company, there's revenue, how you pay with credit cards or ACH wire transfers, bring it in, manage the money on balance sheet, send it out for payroll and vendor disbursements. It was a tech heavy role, was in that for a couple of years. That bank was acquired by another California Irvine based bank. Saw myself on an airplane once every few months. I had a small young family, so that's not the life for me. Left and went to, again, another smaller community bank as a commercial banker, individual contributor, and was living a really good life. The kids were young. My wife stopped working, and we were just doing the typical American dream thing. And that's when the tragedy that I spoke of. So this has brought us now up to, to 2016. And right before that occurred, the president of the bank was asking me to consider taking on a commercial team leader role, a new position that they were developing. The organization was managed really flat. He wanted some leadership in between himself and the production team and was asking me. And, and I said, no, I said, no, I don't want that. I've been in leadership roles and I'm happy with my life right now. And then I lost my wife. And when I said everything changed, everything changed. So I said yes to the leadership opportunity. And it was, it was a really strange experience, Ken, because I stepped in knowing how to do the job, knowing how to do the work. But with a level of detachment, I wasn't anxious about it. I wasn't, I don't know what the right words are, but it was, I, I would approach the work just to say like, yeah, I got this. It's going to be cool. Everything's going to be fine. Like really chill. And then that bank got acquired. And it was like, okay, everything gets turned upside down. We went through some stuff and leading a team through an acquisition where the executive management of the acquiring bank says, we want you to keep all of the customers that we just bought in this acquisition. Can you do that? And because I was in the position that I was in, just my headspace, I said, yeah, I can do that. If you give me everything I ask for, right? There was a real trade-off there. And, and they said, yes. And we did. And I asked them for a lot and they supported. So three years into that, we're now 2021. No, we're, we're in 2020. We're right post COVID. And I called my boss and I said, okay, I think I've done the job that you asked me to do. So all this time, so 20, a little over 20 years, you've been in the banking business, right? As an executive. 25 years total. So I called my boss and I said, I've done the job that I think you wanted me to do. What was the name of this last bank, the one that you were most recently at? The one I'm speaking of is Columbia Bank. Columbia Bank. Okay, I've heard of them, actually. They're a good size regional, right? Yeah, they are. And a well-performing, solid bank. I'm looking at my P&L for my division. At this time, I'm managing a book of business that's about a half a billion dollars, 500 million in commercial corporate business. And so I say to my boss, I'm looking at the P&L. I can't see a way for us to reach the level of profitability that's necessary to make sense. The only thing we can do is either affect customers by raising price or lowering interest on their deposits or raising the price of the charge them, or I'm going to have to lay off staff on my team. Either of those scenarios are going to negatively impact the clients of the bank. I said, I think you got to cut me. I think you have to cut my position and take the folks that are on my team and put them on other teams and just cut the overhead. His first response was, no way. No way. We're not going to do that. But about three months later, he called me back. Yeah, we're, we're going to do that. So I thought that was going to be the end of my banking career. I knocked on doors, looked through windows. The, the things that I was looking for didn't happen. So another bank was really interested in recruiting me. I said, yes, lasted a year. This was January of 2021 now. 
lasted a year and I just, I really knew my time was done. So February, 2022, I announced my retirement from banking without a real clear plan of what I was going to do next. But uh, here we are, I wrote a book and now I'm doing podcasts. I want to talk about the book, but then I want to go back to your experience of, you know, losing a spouse. And that's incredibly uh, impactful thing, I'm sure, in a lot of ways. So I guess you're now doing, as you mentioned, the coaching for the middle management. When did you start writing the book? How was the process of writing it? Tell us about the book. When I decided that my banking career was done and without having a clear path forward, late one night, I bought a URL and built a website just so I could feel comfortable that there was something there. Just for those listening, just so you have a timeline, like we're talking now, it's July 2022. And you left that bank in February of 2022. So it's really only been about four or five months for all of this that you're going to tell us, right? Yeah, I built this website, chosen leader, chosen leader.com. And there's a whole story to that. Yeah. So one of my mentors, he was a preacher of leadership, and he would give this leadership sermon. And he would say, emphatically that leadership is a choice. And he'd say it three times, leadership is a choice. And he'd yell the third time, leadership is a choice. And I always thought I understood what he meant was that leadership was a choice that someone made to become a leader. And that's kind of true, but that's not really what he meant. Leadership is a choice that one person makes to follow another. So John Maxwell said it this way, if you think you're leading, but nobody's following, well, then you're just taking a walk, right? Leadership doesn't occur until someone chooses to follow. So what does it take for someone to choose to follow you? This has been like the focus of my study and examination around leadership for years is why do people follow? So that's what I've built the brand around. The chosen leader brand is that leaders are chosen. They're not just born nor built, but they must also be chosen. It's really from the point of view of the follower. So you're essentially, in order to be a leader, you have to deserve those followers, right? I don't even know if I'd put that judgment on it. To be a leader, you have to have followers. And people will follow. People followed Hitler, right? Did he deserve that? But they chose to. That's what I'm so curious about. What is it about that? So I want to spend a lot of my life understanding and and working in that space, examining that. And then here I've got this career of like failure followed by success, followed by failure, followed by success, right? I've learned a lot of lessons and I enjoy writing. So I want to write a book about it. I want to share this. And I've got this urge to share comes from this place where I don't want all of the experiences in my life to be lived in vain. I don't want to keep them all to myself. I want to share them because I think that gives meaning to those things for me. It's very selfish of me to share my experiences so that I feel like my experiences have some value. And yet, when I do share story and share experience, I see others in their life and in their growth. And it's very, very rewarding. So I want that. Like, I want to step into that space. The book is called Six Word Lessons for Middle Managers, 100 Lessons from the Field. So tell us about what's in the book. And who is the book for? I wanted to be really specific about who I was writing to. And so middle managers is my target audience. Google will tell me that um, there are 11 million middle managers in the U.S. workforce. That's a big enough audience for me. What I found, though, is that nobody really wants to identify as the middle manager. (laughs) So... So maybe from a, a marketing... If you wrote a book like, you know, XYZ for, well, actually, the for dummies series, you know, I guess uh, people are willing to identify as dummies. So maybe it's not a hopeless cause. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That, that one's a little cheeky. The, the middle managers, though, people are like, I don't know, there's stigma to that, that maybe I wasn't sensitive enough to from a marketing perspective, but whatever. The only autonomous corporate leader, in my opinion, is someone who is a founder who is an entrepreneur. I mean, even a CEO of a publicly traded company is managing from the middle because they report to a board of directors. Correct, right, right. Everybody answers to somebody, I mean, at some level, but yeah. On some level. So that's the perspective that I took in writing the book is that this isn't about an individual's executive leadership. This is about how do you lead various constituencies where you've got, maybe you've got peer colleagues 
that you rely on, that your team relies on their team. You've got subordinates, you've got executive leaders, like you're being pulled in all kinds of directions when you're in the middle. And that was my experience for the better part of 25 years. By the way, I think I noticed this, is is this like a series, the six word lessons? It's a series, right? So there's all kinds of different six word lessons for different things. Okay. Yeah, it's the 53rd book in a series that was developed by a friend of mine named Lonnie Paselli. So when I wanted to write a book, I went to Lonnie and his wife, Patty, because they help folks self-publish. And I had a few ideas and they said, well, what do you think about this? And I said, perfect. It's perfect. So tell us briefly what's in the book. Give us a couple of the highlights. You mentioned the two on vulnerability. So maybe talk about it a little bit more. Well, there's another one. Yeah, you you mentioned Manson and kind of his focus on hope. And so one of the lessons in my book is that hope is not a winning strategy. So in and of itself, that one could challenge you. But each lesson is followed by a paragraph that unpacks it a little bit. Hope in and of itself is not a winning strategy. Rather, hope is a mindset. And so a strategy without hope is destined to fail. But if all you're doing is hoping that things are going to work out, chances are low. And yet I live a life of hope. And even, you know, looking through the tragedies that I've shared with you, a lot of folks will ask me, like, how do you have a positive attitude? And it's because hope. It's because tomorrow, and you shared a post months ago where you referenced David Hume. The sun came up yesterday and it was something kind of philosophical that it's not guaranteed, but you have to assume that it will happen. Yeah, that's right. And that kind of stuff hits for me so well. So that another lesson in my book is manage to the most optimistic outcome. And this came from an experience that I had working with a CFO when our bank, the bank that I told you about was failing. And I asked him, he had a positive attitude. And he was, and I was like, Bill, where's your head at? And he said, you have to manage to the optimistic outcome and hedge for the downside. But if all you're doing is hedging for the downside, your chances of success are nil. You have to manage to the optimistic outcome. You have to be hope oriented if you want to achieve success. In my opinion, there's balance to that too, because hope is not a winning strategy in and of itself. It sounds like a great book. I'm looking forward to reading it myself. Folks that want to get a copy, I guess they can go to your website and find it, chosen-leader.com. So talk a little bit about the work you're doing now, because I know, you know, book publishing is sort of a way to give back and to give people good content, know who you are, know your expertise. So tell us about your work at Chosen Leader now. Who are you serving? What kind of clients? How do you work? How do you help people to reach the same type of levels of high performance that you were able to generate yourself when you did all these banking type jobs? Is it for people in the banking industry? Is it other industries? Just tell us about that. Industry agnostic. And I have been delightfully surprised at a very diverse array of clients that I'm working with. So I'm intentionally speaking to folks that are in middle management in corporate America. And yet, in addition to that audience, Folks are responding to my messages. I worked with a woman who was promoted for the first time into a leadership position. And that was like right center bullseye of who my target audience is. Because many of the challenges that she's facing in this new leadership position, she didn't want to take to her boss. She didn't want to bring them home. She didn't want to take to peers, right? All for very valid reasons. You know, she wants to show up confident and capable and We worked together and for, I'm going to say the first four months in her new role, we were together every two weeks and building strategy and talking through communication stuff. And so that was, like I say, center bullseye. Juxtapose that with my, the most recent client that signed up a couple of days ago, who is a nonprofit CEO, started a nonprofit organization four or five years ago, and is now adding staff and at a level where he recognizes he needs to change from kind of hands-on manager to executive level leader. So this is wonderful. And I've got a big part of my life and career that's connected in the nonprofit sector. I don't think we have time to go there, but suffice it to say that that makes it a very good fit, which segue into, I've been advising a nonprofit board of directors for three months now around vision, mission, strategy, and growth. And then There's an entrepreneur that's building a program. And so I have worked with him around that. And then a business coach 
who is focused on culture has partnered with me to be a financial consultant to his business clients. So like there's an array of call it five different types of folks that I'm working with uh, and I love it. But to go back to like my ideal perfect center bullseye is the woman that I spoke of who was 15 year industry experience promoted into leadership for the first time, given the keys to the car. Okay. How do I drive? Well, Nick can help. Mm -hmm. And when they work with you, so if you're their executive coach, you're meeting with them, how often in a month? And does the company typically pay? Do they pay? How does that work? All of my experience so far has been paid for by the client. If I'm working in a corporate setting, there's a bit of conflict of interest that I'd have to reconcile with. I'd have to just be really clear because a lot of times when someone wants to get promoted, they have to change companies. It, when someone wants to make more money, they got to change companies. It angers me that that's the truth, but it is the truth. I'd feel bad if a company hired me to coach one of their managers and I'm saying, well, you, you know, you could make 40 more grand across the street, right? But that's just the truth. And that would be my obligation to them. They're paying me directly. So typically they would meet with you twice a month then? Is that the traditional? For an hour, two hours? What's your format? We'll kick off with two or three hours of a deep dive. I got to get to know you. And I use a couple of tools, call them personality assessment tools that not because I'm reading the data and believing. Which ones do you use? I'm a big fan of predictive index. My go-tos, the most frequent, is a combination of Enneagram and Strengths Finder because they approach the person from two different perspectives. Strengths Finder is as it's labeled, right? Here's everything you're good at. And Enneagram is uh, here's everything in your shadow. So generally, what I'll do is I'll provide these tests as a part of the coaching package, take the assessment, we each will review. But my questions are, you know, what of this do you agree with? And it gives us a common language to talk through and get to the root of some things. So we start deep dive. And then I'd say the typical arrangement is once a month session, Zoom, you know, where we're going and an hour, if an hour goes to an hour and a half or two, whatever, it's, it's focused on that. My main job is, you know, investment management and I run a company. I'm an entrepreneur. We do a bunch of different things, but I actually was asked one time by somebody I knew very well to be their business coach. So I coached them for a little over a year and it was really transformative for them and actually pretty transformative for me. I got as much out of it. It was really, really cool. So if people are listening to this and they're interested in reaching out to you to maybe see if you know you might be the right coach for them, how do they get in touch with you? What's the best way? So on the website, there's a services page. They can book a free consultation. And I think it says like a 15 minute consult, but they always go 30 or 45. So chosen-leader.com. That's where people go, right? Yep. One thing I want to add into this that um, is in my imagination, and I, I plan to launch uh, January of 2023, is a chosen leader group. I imagine this to be capped at 20 people who are in management positions already, so not up and coming, but they're there already. We would meet via Zoom on a monthly basis, let's say, but also in kind of a 24-hour real-time access using platform like Telegram or Signal, I've not decided on, on which exactly, but call it a peer-to-peer -peer group with my facilitation guidance, looking for members across the country. And so here again, it's like you know, Ken runs into a problem with an employee or is having a challenge with his boss. You can take it to the group and maybe somebody's been there before. And I certainly have 25 years experience. And there's a similar group for CEOs. It's called Vistage. And CEOs pay, I think, like 20 grand a year. I think it's more than that. Actually, Vistage is quite pricey. I'm in a mastermind of real estate investors because I'm quite active in real estate. I'm thinking of starting one for investment professionals. I've formed groups. So absolutely, peer-to-peer -peer groups, there's so much value and magic in those things. I absolutely think that's a wonderful initiative that you're announcing. So what I want to end on, because we're almost at time, is I want to go back to that story that you kind of started with about, you know, you're walking down the road and I guess your wife at the time, right? Got hit by a car, obviously some sort of accident. You lost her. How do you even begin to process that? And tell us how you kind of got through that. And then maybe for others who might be going through something like that to maybe benefit from your strength and your experience. And then 
now it's five, six years, seven years later. I'm guessing there's not a day that goes by that you don't think about her. That's been the case with me and the people that I've lost. So let's end on that. The toughness of it, but also what good. There's a few punchlines to this story, and I'll start with those. Number one is I thought I was in better shape than I was, and I was in a really dark place for a few years. So that's truth. Number two is before this accident occurred, I was a uh, agnostic, borderline atheist in terms of spirituality. But in the moment of this accident, I found myself on my knees holding her and praying to a God that I didn't know, but he responded and we had a conversation and that conversation hasn't stopped. Through the darkest hours of my life, there is a real dichotomy of salvation there was hope and joy and love and pain and sadness and loss. And that took years to process. I found my way out of it with the strength of others. There are countless people in my life that showed up in ways that saved my life. The thing that I might say to someone in this same experience is, don't isolate, reach out and let people help you. I resisted help for years and thought I could do it on my own. And I showed up fine to the outside world most of the time, but it was at home behind closed doors that I broke down. Really, it was in that season of 2020 and the pandemic lockdowns affected so many in, in so many ways. And for me, the experience was one where I it was a before and after. There's definitely a before and after in my life around that where I stepped into a self-discovery and kind of boldly chased an identity that I had lost. So here's the story for me. Before the accident uh, occurred, if I was on stage or, or in public and asked to introduce myself, you know, we do this all the time in the networking and the things like that in the business meetings. So I would say it this way. Hi, my name's Nick. I'm a husband and I'm a father and I happen to be a banker too because that was my identity. First and foremost is a husband and then a father and then a banker. And in a minute's time, my identity was gone. And for years, I didn't have identity. I didn't have purpose. I didn't have a mission. I didn't have a vision for my life. I was lost and it was horrible. How did you get it back? I allowed people to help. So this is the vulnerability thing. And those people who I brought into my life and allowed to speak into my life said, you need purpose. You need a vision. You need something to live for. And I believed them. And so I went in pursuit of that. And now I have that. And my life feels like it has meaning again where for a couple of years, it, it didn't. Well, thank you so much for being here, present, vulnerable, real. Really appreciate it. Anybody listening to this, if you're in a position where, and by the way, I have to say, uh, this was both my experience as a business coach, but also just in general, the highest performing people all have coaches, whether you realize it or not. Certainly it's true in, in sports and all, it's just not even an option. They have whole teams around them. But what you don't realize is every major CEO, most of their senior team, and most high-performing entrepreneurs have a coach or two. So really, if you don't, and by the way, I have a video that I put out. I don't know if you've even seen it, Nick, but it's called, it explains what's Solomon's Paradox. And the subtext of that video, it's on YouTube, on one of my, in my YouTube channel, Investing with Ken. There's a power to just having a coach, even a bad coach. And I think you're far from a bad coach, you're probably an excellent coach. The power of just getting together with someone, it's like a mastermind of two and having to talk through things and getting feedback on that. There's just incredible power to it. So anyone listening to this who might even be like wondering, don't even think about it. Just call Nick, try it out. You'll be shocked at how powerful having a coach can be to really accelerate and transform your results. And I mean that sincerely. 
Nick is not paying me for this endorsement. So just from my own personal experience, go watch my video. So, cause I really lay it out in 30 minutes of what, what that power of the coaching relationship is. It's broader. It's like having advisors, why advisors add value and coaches are a type of an advisor. I really enjoyed my conversation with Nick Anderson today. His stories of personal tragedy and triumph were inspiring to me, and I hope they'll be inspiring to you too. Some of my biggest takeaways from our conversation were how knowing and being aware of our shortcomings and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and accepting support from our peers is so critical. We can learn from our challenging times as much as, if not more than we learn from our accomplishments, something that I've personally experienced and also wholeheartedly agree with. I also enjoyed Nick's observations on the importance of sharing our teachings with others. In addition, I encourage you to read any of the books mentioned in the show, including Six Word Lessons for Middle Managers, 100 Lessons from the Field by Nick Anderson, and The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck by Mark Manson. I encourage you to watch How Solomon's Paradox Explains Why We All Need Good Coaches and Advisors on my YouTube channel. Thank you very much for listening and see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Compound Ideas, hosted by Ken Majmidar of Ridgewood Investments. Connect with Ken, learn more about the show, and never miss an episode at compoundideashow.com. Ken Majmidar is the founder of Ridgewood Investments and several other affiliated companies. All opinions expressed by Ken and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Ridgewood Investments or any of its affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as basis for investment decisions. Clients of Ridgewood Investments and its affiliates may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast.